So welcome, welcome everybody to this seminar today. Uh, this seminar is going to be different because it's going to be in English. So excuse me for my broken English. I will try to do my best. So I'm Alejandro Jaramillo. I'm, I'm transmitting from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which is located in Mexico City. And I'm part of the group of the research group of micro scale interactions in the Center of Atmospheric Science at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Our group is led by, by Garcia de Raga, and we are composed also by Luis Ladino, Christian Dominguez, and Alejandro. Christian will be joining us organizing the question and answer se section. And our group works uh, mainly in, in cloud physics, aerosol physics, like the Sahara and dust, all breaks that we have recently. We also work on hurricane and deconvection and tropical waves. Um, first, um, we also want to show you that the center, our center has an, a journal, it's called Atmosphere. Uh, this is an open journal, so it's free to read, but also it's free for the authors. And it's a very, very interesting effort that the university is doing to promote atmospheric science and to publish scientific papers. And it's, it's, it's peer review. It has DOI and it's has is indexed by Scopus and other citations index. Also, this journal has an opinion section, a very interesting part of the journal, that has like a more uh, divulgation type of articles. And we have different different uh, articles in this, uh, this opinion section. You can go read these articles. Also have DOI, so you can it can be cited. Uh, uh, there are authors, so it will be very interesting for you to go and and try and read our journal. And if you want to to collaborate, you can read the papers, cite the papers, or you can submit papers to this journal. It's a big effort that the university is doing to promote atmospheric science. And it's free for the authors, so you will have no page chargers, and it's free to read. It's an open journal. Okay, I'm going to present a little instructions here about how it's going to be the, the question and answer section at the end of the seminar. So you have in your screens something like this, this page this page where you have different several options. At the end of the seminar, you will be able to ask a question. So in order to ask a question, you will raise your hand, by pressing this hand button. This button is going to turn green, indicating that you are asking a question. And Christian is going to turn your microphone on so when the microphone button turns green, it means that you will be able to ask your questions. So we are going to do the question and answer section at the end of the seminar. So please uh, be ready to ask your questions. And I'm going to present our speaker today is Dr. Saint Martin. He is right now at Colorado State University. His bachelor is in mathematics and his PhD is in applied mathematics and atmospheric science. He worked his PhD at Columbia University with Adam Sobel. And right now he is a postdoc at Colorado State University working with Eric Maloney. Uh, uh, same uh, is a very is one is an expert in the in tropical waves and NGO and QBO. So he's going to speak a little bit about his his research, and 
Also, he participated in several campaigns like this one. This is a picture of saying releasing a balloon and uh, a balloon in, in the Costa Rica campaign of a trek last September. So he has a lot of very interesting things to say. So please welcome Sane. And I'm going to give Sane the, the rights to, to be presented right now. So thank you very much, Sane, for being here today. Sure. OK, can you hear me OK? Yes. Great. Um, all right, so thank you all so Wait, wait a second. OK, I think that worked. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. Right now. OK, um, so thanks so much. Uh, Alejandro and, and Chris for organizing this seminar. And uh, I'm really excited to see so many people from, from I think all around the world. We have people from a bunch of different countries joining. Um, so I'm grateful to everyone. And I hope that everyone, you know, regardless of where you are, that you're safe and that you're doing okay um, during what I know are very stressful times. So, so today, as Alejandro said, I'm going to talk about my, my work and generally the sort of field of um, studying this interaction between two important modes of variability in the tropics. So one is the Madden-Julian oscillation and one is the quasi-biennial oscillation. And I wanna thank in particular um, three collaborators who were, who were instrumental with this project that I'll talk about from our group. That's Adam Sobel and Shu Guang Wang who are at Columbia and Clara Orby who is a scientist at NASA in New York City. And there's many other people working on this question and I'll, I'll present a lot of, um, of papers from other groups as well. So uh, I thought that I would start today by introducing what the MJO and the QBO are because um, I know that we have a, a wide range of both experience levels in terms of graduate students and more senior folks, but also people study a lot of different parts of the tropics. So I'll spend quite a bit of time motivating what the MJO and the QBO are and then I'll talk about this very surprising connection between them. So this MJO-QBO link. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about modeling that connection, um, which is a lot of work that, that I have done recently and why that's a sort of important question and what some challenges are. So hopefully I can, I can uh, convince you that this is an important question. So I wanna start with just an overview of what is the Madden-Julian oscillation. I think this is one of the most important oscillations in the tropics. And if you take nothing else away from this seminar, it would be to know what this oscillation is. So it's named after the two scientists who discovered it in 1971. And this cartoon here, this picture, shows the main features of the MJO. So we're looking down on the tropics, right? Here's Australia, India, and Africa. And we're looking on big spatial scales. And you can see that the MJO has two phases or two components to it. One is what's called an active phase where you get very stormy wet conditions. You get ascending motion throughout the troposphere and then you have these overturning zonal wind cells. So you have divergence at low levels and, or excuse me, convergence at low levels and divergence aloft. And then there's also what's called a suppressed or a dry phase where you get downward motion and you get dry conditions. And this whole system forms and then it propagates, as we'll see on the next slide, out over the Indian Ocean. Now, one of the most compelling things about the MJO is that we still don't really know what it is in terms of why it forms and why it moves. So the MJO is, some people call it like the holy grail of tropical meteorology. It's one of the most important oscillations in the tropics. Uh, this is a plot which shows a typical MJO life cycle. So what's shown here in blue is increased rain, more precipitation, and red is decreased rain relative to the background state. So this is just MJO precipitation. And you see these eastward propagating blobs of increased convection that move from the Indian Ocean into the Central Pacific. And this cycle of MJ, the MJO forming and moving and dying, you can see in the upper right, in this, in this um, cartoon, it takes around 48 days, 
In general, the MJO happens between around 30 and 60 day timescales. So it's what we call sub-seasonal variability. And the last thing I want to point out is, um, if you're not familiar with the MJO, when we talk about the phase of the MJO, so you see here it says phase, RMM phase, that's just where it is in its life cycle. So if the MJO is in phase one, there's rain over the Indian Ocean, phase four is rain over the maritime continent and Indonesia and so on. So phase is a, a physical location. Now, the MJO is mostly a tropical phenomena, but it has impacts around the world. And this panel here on the left side, you can see various regions uh, in different colors. Those are regions that are influenced by the MJO in some way. So I won't go through everything, but I'll just point out, for example, in boreal summer, which is this top panel, you see that the MJO modulates precipitation in the region where it's active, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, but it also modulates precipitation in Central America and Southern Mexico. It impacts tropical cyclones, that's these green or these uh, these red blobs here in the Western Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, and the North Atlantic. So it has global impacts. You can see down here, this is boreal winter. It impacts El Nino, that's this yellow blob here. It can change moisture plumes on the west coast of the United States and so on. I should say this is from a paper by, uh, by Damat et al. in 2014. So even though the MJO is a tropical thing, it matters, it matters globally. Um, in particular, I, I wish that I could be um, with the group in Mexico City, but I you know, obviously cannot. I thought I would talk a little about how the MJO impacts Central America and Mexico and even Mexico City to try to convince you that this is a problem that really matters. So thanks to Alejandro Jaramillo uh, for sending me this, this slide. This is from a presentation by Graciela Raga uh, and it's showing results from a 2012 paper which looked at in different MJO phases. So that's what's labeled here. This is phase one through eight in the top left. You can see Phase, MJO phase four and five in the top right. In different phases, where is there anomalous precipitation in the shading and where do tropical cyclones form? So for example, you see if you compare the top two panels that when the MJO is in phase one and eight, you get a lot of increased rain off of the western coast of, Me of Mexico and South uh, Central America. You see many more tropical cyclones that form near the coast versus when the MJO is in phase four and five, we have less rain, fewer tropical cyclones. In the bottom right, if the MJO is in phase six or seven, the location of those cyclones is spread out. So it matters quite a bit, right, what the MJO is doing. And if we want to predict things like precipitation or cyclones a month or two ahead, it's good to know about the state of the MJO. And then bringing it even more locally, um, there's been some great work. Uh, this is a paper by, by Brad Barrett and Graciela Raga looking in Mexico City at whether the MJO impacts surface ozone. So these plots are some sort of normalized measure of surface ozone at different sites in Mexico City. So the different colors here are different, different measurement sites around the city. And you can see that in different MJO phases, so the x-axis here is MJO phases, you can sometimes get much less or much more surface ozone. And that's linked to human health impacts. So it matters quite a bit. So you can see, for example, oops, in, in June, July, August, when the MJO is in phase five or six, you tend to get peak ozone. And when the MJO is in phase one, you get less ozone. And so again, if we wanna make predictions on these sub-seasonal timescales, even in Mexico City, this MJO matters. So hopefully that's convinced you that this is, a, this is a topic or the MJO is a question that's worth looking at, sort of regardless of where you live. So, okay, now I'm gonna take a little bit of a step back. So the MJO and, and a lot of what I've talked about is signals in the surface or in the troposphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere. But as many of you know, right, the next layer up above the troposphere is called the stratosphere. And this diagram is not completely correct. In the tropics, the stratosphere starts at around 18 kilometers and goes up to around 50 kilometers. So a lot of what I do is working on this interface between the stratosphere and the troposphere. And I'll talk about in particular why that matters for the MJO. So in the stratosphere, one of the, if not the most um, prominent signals in the tropical stratosphere is this feature called the quasi-biennial oscillation. So this is the second of these two oscillations that I'm gonna talk about. And it's, I know it's a little tricky to have MJO and QBO. So try to keep them straight in your mind. The QBO is this stratospheric phenomenon. 
It was discovered a little before the MJO, and you can see this top panel is a uh, time on the x-axis, height on the y-axis diagram of the east-west, the zonal wind in the stratosphere. So red here are westerly winds and blue are easterly winds. And you see these descending patterns that form in the upper stratosphere and propagate downward with time with a period of about two years. So this time series starts in 1960 and goes to 1990. So this reversal in the direction of the, of the tropical zonal wind is the main signal of the QBO, the main feature of the QBO. It tends to be only in the tropics, and because it has this funny descending uh, nature, usually the way that we define the QBO is we pick one level and we talk about the wind at that level. So this bottom panel here is the QBO taking the zonal wind at 50 hectopascal, which is around 21 kilometers. So this lowest part of the stratosphere. And you see this is now data from a bunch of different data sets from 1980 through 2019 you see this oscillation between westerly and easterly. So I'll talk about whether the QBO is easterly or westerly. And by that in this talk, I just mean the lower stratospheric winds are easterly or westerly. Okay, so we have these two uh, phenomena, the MJO and the QBO, and they're very different in many regards, right? The QBO is stratospheric and it has a time scale of many years. The MJO is mostly tropospheric and it has a much shorter time scale. And so maybe it's it's, not a surprise that people haven't really looked too hard at the connection between these two phenomena until relatively recently. And it was very surprising to find that they're actually very closely connected. So there's a very strong link between these two phenomena that was discovered in 2016 by uh, Sokwu San's group in the university, uh, Seoul University in South Korea. Um, so the main feature of this MJO-QBO link, and this is probably the second big point that I want you to get. So one is to know what the MJO is. The second is to understand the, the nature of this link. So in the winter, the Northern Hemisphere winter, so let's say roughly December, January, February, when the QBO is easterly, the MJO tends to be much stronger and more active. And this is a nice clear plot from this original UN Sun paper. It's a GRL paper, so it's, it's fairly short, which shows the amplitude of the MJO on the y-axis as a function of the MJO phase. And they've taken the easterly QBO winters in blue and the westerly QBO winters in red. And you see this big separation, right? So when the QBO is easterly, the MJO has an amplitude of around two. Don't worry about the units here, but two is large. One is usually active. So it has a fairly high, oops, sorry, high amplitude. When the QBO is westerly, that amplitude is much lower, around 1.3. And it turns out that about 50% of the year-to-year -year variability in the MJO is due to the QBO. So more than any other mode of variability, more than El Nino, more than any climate change signal, the QBO seems to control the strength of the MJO from one year to the next. Um, this is another way of looking at this plot that's maybe a little more intuitive. So what's shown here is similar to the cartoon I showed before. So the red and the blue are decreased or increased precipitation associated with the MJO. And if you look just at the left-hand side, the three different panels as you go from top to bottom just show three different phases in the MJO life cycle. So you see this blue blob here which is associated with the active phase, moves east as you go down these panels, right? So the difference between the left and the right column is the left panels are easterly QBO winters and the right panels are westerly QBO winters. And you see much stronger signals. You see deeper blues and darker reds, which corresponds to increased precipitation or decreased precipitation in the active and suppressed phase when the QBO is easterly versus when it's westerly. So you can see this MJO-QBO link in many, many different measures of the MJO. And that's convinced us that it's really a robust feature of the climate system. Now, uh, if you study the MJO for a living, this is very exciting because we've found this mode of variability in the climate system that matters to the MJO a lot. But if you don't study the MJO for a living, you might wonder, okay, why, why do I care? Why does this, this matter? One way that I think it matters for, for anyone interested in subseasonal forecasting is that the QBO changes the predictability of the MJO. And that's what this plot shows. So what's shown here on the y-axis is, it says bivariate correlation skill. Basically what that is, is it's a measure of 
how skillful a forecast model is at predicting the MJO. So the black bars here are basically measures of how many days can we make good predictions of the MJO. And the darker colors, you're defining skill more strictly, right? And then the lighter colors take a more relaxed, you know, you, you relax your, your qualification for skill. So for example, in this model, the BOM model, this is the Australian forecast model that's designed to predict the MJO. You can see that uh, the MJO is predictable out to around 27 days. That's how you read this, this black line. In the ECMWF model, predictability is 35 days. In the JMA, the Japanese model, predictability is around 15 days and so on. So what they did in this study is they took all of these forecasts of the MJO and then they separated out the forecasts when the QBO is easterly and westerly. And that's the blue and the red lines. Oops, sorry. Oh, I don't know why that, let me get that back for you. Sorry, so the blue and the red lines, as I was saying here, uh, are the predictability when the QBO is easterly versus when it's westerly. And what you see is across all of these models, the blue line is higher. What that means is you have more MJO predictability. And it's actually about a week more when the QBO is easterly. So if you figure we can make skillful MJO predictions for around two to three weeks, one more week is a huge amount of skill. So whatever the QBO does to the MJO, however it changes it, it has real implications, not only theoretically, but for people who wanna make good subseasonal forecasts. There's also several mysterious aspects of the MJO QBO link, and I, I'm gonna um, move off of this relatively quickly, but I'll just point out some of, the, some of the things that I think are most sort of mysterious that we still don't understand. So one is, why is it only the true in December, January, February that they're connected? So everything I've shown is winter, and I'll keep showing only winter. If you look in other seasons, there's no connection. So we need to explain why is that the case. The second point is what I'm calling uniqueness. Uh, basically, it's why is the MJO so strongly affected? So if you look at, for example, the QBO connection to El Nino, or the QBO connection to the tropical mean state, or if you study tropical meteorology, you can look at the QBO's connection to convectively coupled equatorial waves, like Kelvin waves and Rossby waves. Really, the QBO has no strong impact on any of those other modes of variability, not nearly as strong as for the MJO. So what is it about the MJO that makes it so susceptible to this stratospheric impact? And finally, this is an interesting result from, from Phil Klotzbach et al. in 2019, which shows that it seems like there was no MJO-QBO link early in the record, and it's only emerged after 1980. So we can talk more about this plot. Um, it's a little complicated to, to describe. We can talk more in the questions, but basically what they're showing is the correlation between the MJO and the QBO in winter as a function of time over the whole of the 20th century. So it's a little tricky to reconstruct the MJO and the QBO. We don't have good measurements before the 1970s, but you can do it with some uncertainty, and that's this shading here, this gray shading. But what you see is that there's this dashed uh, black line, which is the significant signal, that the MJO-QBO correlation is basically near zero. And then around 1980, something changes in the climate system, and you go from having no strong link to this strong anti-correlation. And that's another feature that we would like to observe. I'm not really gonna talk too much about, um, about these mysteries. We still don't have answers to them, but I think that they're quite compelling if you work on this problem. So, the question that I think everyone wants to know and that would help us understand a lot of these different uh, features is how are the MJO and the QBO linked? What are the different mechanisms that might explain their connection? So I'm only going to talk about one in the majority of the talk and, and we can talk more about other mechanisms. If people have questions, they could ask. But one of the mechanisms that's received the most attention has to do with QBO temperature anomalies. So I talked about the QBO zonal wind signals. But the QBO also changes the temperature in the, in the stratosphere and the upper troposphere. And that's what's shown here. So this is the latitude height plot of zonally averaged temperature. And what I've done to make this plot is taken the difference between QBO easterly periods and QBO westerly periods. So this is from monthly data and then you difference those two and this is what you get. So what you see are cold anomalies in the upper troposphere. So 50 hectopascals is sort of the start of the stratosphere, maybe 100. So right around here in the lower stratosphere, upper troposphere, there's these cold anomalies of around three degrees. And the idea is um, that when you have these cold temperatures, you destabilize the upper atmosphere and that allows convection to go deeper. 
And the opposite is true when the QBO is westerly. You have warm anomalies, and that decreases the that increases the stability and stops convection. That argument isn't completely satisfying, right? That doesn't explain why the MJO would be affected and a few other things, but that's the main idea of this temperature mechanism that we're going to test. So keep that in mind going forward. This is one proposed explanation for how this works. So what we would like to do is look at this question in models. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put forward four reasons why I think modeling is particularly important. So one reason is that it would give us better statistics. So we only have, let's say, 40 years of observed, right? 40 or 50 years of observed uh, record. And that only gives us a few QBO cycles, right? So if we're looking at these QBO signals only in winter, we really only have between, let's say 12 and 15 easterly and westerly phases. So if we could use models, we could improve the statistics and look at longer, longer records. We could also examine hypotheses about mechanisms by doing clever model experiments, right? That would give us some confidence and in general, if models show an MJO QBO link, it makes us think that our models do a good job of capturing important processes in the tropics, right? This MJO QBO link is a big feature in the tropical atmosphere, seems very strong in observations, so we would hope that models can get it. And we could also ask questions about how the MJO QBO link will change in the future. So today I'm gonna to focus on modeling in global climate models, um, just for time and for focus, but there has been work on this problem in other models, and we could also talk about that, that in the questions if you're interested. So the challenge with modeling the MJO and the QBO is that it's been hard to find models that get either one of those features historically. So if you went back, let's say 20 years ago, it'd be very hard to find a model with a good MJO and separately hard to find one with a good QBO. And remember, we're looking for a model that has both and then their interaction. Um, this is a this panel here shows um, results from a paper that was published this year on the CMIP-6 models. So these are the current generation climate models. And they looked at the QBO in many, many, many different models, something like 30 of these different uh, CMIP-6 models. And I've just picked a few here to, show, to, to, to make a point. So the top left panel shows observations. And again, this is a height time diagram of zonal wind. So this is, you see these descending easterlies and westerlies, right? This is like the plots I've shown before. And these three different climate models are all relatively state-of-the-art. You see one of them has a fairly good QBO in the top right. If you study the QBO, you'll spot biases right away. But just by eye, you know, we have these descending patterns. The period looks good. The amplitude looks good. Some current climate models still have no QBO, like the bottom left. And some have very um, irregular-looking oscillations in the stratosphere. So the bottom right model it certainly has an oscillation, but it's clearly very different from what the observed world is doing. So it's hard to find a good model for this question. And the same types of issues are true for the MJO. But we're at the point now, I think, where there are enough global climate models that get both of these features that we can start looking at this question. So the beginning of the work modeling this connection in global models started in 2018. So it's fairly new. Uh, all of this is fairly new, new research. And basically, uh, Lee and Klingemann in 2018, they took the Met Office model, the UK climate model, which had a reasonably good MJO and a QBO, and they showed it had no connection. So you can see on the left here, this is the correlation of the QBO on the x-axis, that's the wind at 50 hectopascal, and the MJO strength, and the correlation coefficient is minus 0.5, and it's statistically significant in observations. You can see that in their model, which um, is on the right, which has many more years, uh, because they were able to do ensemble runs, there's no strong connection, right? The correlation is, is minus 0.15. So they don't see a, a strong link like observed. This is one measurement in this paper. They go through a lot of other tests and basically they conclude that there's no connection. And now it turns out that right in, in recent years, people have looked at this more generally across many, many, many models. So among the CMIP-5 and the CMIP-6 models, of those that have an MJO and a QBO, none of them show an MJO QBO connection. So this plot um, is from a paper by Jaime Kim et al, which was published this year, and it looks at the CMIP-6 models. So on the x-axis are different CMIP-6 models. I think there's a dozen here or around a dozen. And these are the models that have a good QBO and MJO in a metric that they, you know, they define in this paper. What the y-axis shows is some measure of the MJO QBO link. So what it is is it's the change in MJO activity in QBO East minus QBO West. 
what they actually do is they calculate the standard deviation of outgoing long wave radiation over the warm pool. If that doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. I don't wanna get into the technical details too much. But this black bar here at around three is the observed increase in MJO activity when the QBO is easterly versus westerly. And you can see that these black dots, which are each individual ensemble members from all of these models, none of these black dots comes anywhere near this, this three sigma benchmark that the observations see. And in fact, the, the different ensemble members seem basically clustered around zero for each of the different models. And the gray bars here are what would happen if you just sampled random years and asked, what is the MJO QBO link? You see that basically um, the, the ensemble is consistent with noise. And these are the CMIP, CMIP 6 models. The same is true in the CMIP 5 models. There's only four, but there's another study. So all of the current state-of-the-art GCMs seem to fail at capturing this MJO QBO link. Um, and the question has been why, right? What are, what are GCMs missing in the tropics that, that, um, that has failed to get this connection? So I talked at the beginning about this temperature anomaly, and I'm gonna to return to that now. So basically in the top left panel here, if you just focus on this, this figure on the left, this is that same plot from before showing the change in temperatures and shading in QBO East minus QBO West. So you see these blue signals here in the lower part of the stratosphere, right? Corresponding to a cooling of around three degrees. The bottom panel shows one of the CMIP5 models which has a particularly good MJO and QBO for that period. And you see that these blue signatures are much, much weaker, right? We have much less of a signal in the lower part of the stratosphere. We're missing these temperature anomalies. The plot on the right is very similar to the plot on the left. You just take the average from 10 degrees south to 10 degrees north. So instead of a latitude height plot, you just get a height plot and temperature is what's shown. So it's a little tricky to see, but the black curve with a maximum at around three degree, minus three degrees, that's observations. And then the colored curves are all different climate models. And you see that with really one exception, every single one of the CMIP-6 climate models misses this strong MJO QBO, or excuse me, misses this strong QBO temperature signal. So the models are not showing nearly enough cooling when the QBO is easterly or warming when the QBO is westerly. Um, there's this one outlier in this study, which still didn't show an MJO QBO link. I'm not going to talk too much about that outlier, but the, the paper does discuss it a bit more. So the hypothesis is that we're not getting these QBO temperature signals in the upper part of the troposphere, and that those temperature signals are crucial for getting tropical variability, for getting the MJO correct. So what we have done is we have tried to design an experiment, basically, to get rid of this problem of the poor temperature temperature signals. So our idea was, can we minimize the biases associated with the QBO and then look at how does the MJO respond when we get these temperature signals? So to do this, we used um, the CMIP-6 version of one GCM. We used the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies uh, climate model. It's their current generation version. It's called model E2.1. Um, and we like this model for two reasons. One is we can run it both coupled to an ocean and also in atmosphere only mode. So we did both. I'm gonna mostly talk about the coupled version, but there's, there's not much of a change in the results. And second is this model has a good MJO for a GCM of this resolution. And that's what's shown on the bottom panel here. So what I've plotted is the MJO amplitude. On the left-hand side, I've just binned it by month. So I take some, some 40 year run of the model and the shading is different ensemble members. And from that 40 year, I look at what is the MJO amplitude in every January and every February and so on. And I compare that to observations in black. So you can see that the coupled and the AMIP model have reasonable MJO amplitudes. They get the seasonal cycle, which is a well-known feature of the MJO. If you do the same thing, but you look at the phase of the MJO, the models are also getting reasonably good MJO amplitude. This is a pretty crude uh, measure. We looked at more, more sort of subtle ways of, of diagnosing the MJO in this model. And it, you know, we, we convinced ourselves that the MJO looks, looks pretty good, though there are definitely some biases that I'll, that I'll talk about uh, at the end. So, okay, we have a model with a good MJO, but it has no QBO. And so this immediately, you should be like, wait, how can we, how can we look at the connection when it's missing one of the two things? And I'll explain in a second. So this is a result from uh, a 37-year integration of the model from 1980 to 2017. 
And you can see, right, this is another one of these height time plots of the zonal wind where you would expect to see QBO signals, so above 100 hectopascal, it's just easterly winds. Okay, so we like the MJO, but there's no QBO. However, what we're interested in, remember, is minimizing the QBO. So what we did in this model was we nudged or we relaxed the zonal and meridional wind in the stratosphere in order to capture the QBO signals. So what we basically did is at every time step, right, we took what the model thought the zonal wind should be, and we added a tendency to bring the model closer to the observations, right? So the difference between the observations and the model was added with some relaxation time scale. So basically this parameter tau allows you to control how close the model stays to observations. In this study, we take a reasonably strict nudging. Uh, tau is 12 hours. So the model, as you'll see, looks very close to the, to the observations. We only apply this in the stratosphere above 100 hectopascal. And the reason that we do that is we want the MJO to still be allowed to respond organically. So basically we're imposing a stratosphere that we know looks very close to observations. And we're asking how does the troposphere beneath it change? And in particular, the MJO. So first off, um, nudging reproduces the QBO with a reasonably good degree of fidelity, right? We do a good job of recovering um, the observations. So this plot on the top shows the observed zonal mean, zonal wind, or our, it should say reanalysis, I suppose. These are, this is uh, from MIRA2 reanalysis. And then you see this is the control that I showed before. And then here is the same model, but with the nudging. And it looks very, very close to the observations. There are still a few biases, but by and large, this looks much, much better than any of these other models that have their, their own internal QBOs. So the nudging works to give us a good QBO. Now, we only nudge the zonal and meridional wind in the model. We don't change, we don't nudge the temperature, but it turns out that because of thermal wind constraints, the model still has a good, does a good job of reproducing these temperature signals. So this is a similar plot. I've shown it a few different times now. This is the temperature, right? The QBO east minus west temperature. The left is observations, and then the right two panels are the atmosphere only and the coupled model. And what you see is very strong temperature signals in the lower part of the stratosphere down into the troposphere. If anything, they're actually a bit too strong in the model, but that, that's not a bad thing. We, we're happy to have temperature signals that are bigger than observed. We were trying to get rid of these too weak temperature signals. So, okay, now the question is, we've done this work to get a QBO. We're getting these temperature signals finally correct. How does the MJO change? So to look at this, we did an experiment where we ran 11 different ensemble members. So we ran the model 11 times. In each uh, experiment, we nudged the QBO identically. And so what all that's different is the initial condition of the sea surface temperature. And I'm gonna show plots that look like this. So this is observations. What's shown here is the amplitude of the MJO as a function of MJO phase. And when the red line is greater than the blue line, or the bar, excuse me, that indicates that the MJ was stronger when the QBO was easterly. And these arrows and stars are statistical significance. So you can see, right, in observations, in all eight MJO phases, we get a much stronger MJO when the QBO is easterly. Okay, so now let's do the same thing in the model. Let's start with the full ensemble. So if we take all 11 members, 37 years, this is something like 400 years of data, we get this plot on the right. So while you get stars and arrows, you get statistical significance because you have so many years. What you can see if you look at this is you don't really get the same behavior as observed. So there are a few phases where the MJO is stronger when the QBO is easterly, right? Phases one and two, but equally likely it seems are periods like phases five and six where the MJO is actually stronger when the QBO is westerly. And there's other phases where you see really no change at all, no, no significant change. So this is the first indication that the model, even when we get the QBO right, is still not doing, not, not changing the MJO. If we look at individual ensemble members, so right now if we take one of those 37 years, we can get a wide range of different MJO QBO connections. So this top left panel is observations again. In the top right, I've just picked one ensemble member, and you can see in this run, the MJO was much stronger when the QBO was westerly in several of its phases. There are other ensemble members like this run here, member nine, where at least by this measure, it looks sort of close to the observations. You see, right, 
the red is higher than the blue. The MJO is stronger when the QBO is easterly. And then there are other ensemble members where really nothing changes. You get very little statistical significance. And if you really drill down, there's no clear connection in any of these between the MJO and the QBO by a number of different metrics. So these are just two more ways of looking at the MJO-QBO connection. The left panel is similar to that plot I showed before from the CMIP-6 models. So basically this is a measure of how much does the MJO activity change when the QBO is easterly versus westerly. You see this black cross here is in observations, and then the um, blue and the orange are different ensemble members from the coupled and the AMIT model. And you see basically they're clustered around zero. There's really nothing like the strong observed link. The right column is the correlation. So you see in observations a strong anti-correlation. And in both the coupled and the AMIT model, um, we're not seeing any anywhere near the, the MJO QBO link that we observe. So, okay, the main takeaway then from this work, right? I'm sorry to let you down, but it's 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 a negative result. Imposing the QBO, getting rid of these, these temperature biases in particular that people have hypothesized are why models fail, that doesn't remove the issue of getting the MJO QBO link. So basically it's not enough to just get the QBO right. The models are still missing something. And so the open question that we wish that we could have answered, but that is still an open question, is why do models fail to simulate this connection? Uh, so um, I'm winding down now, so this is gonna be more, you know, more speculative. Here are some potential reasons, I think, and I would be very interested to, to hear people's thoughts or to talk more about them. So one issue is that it may be that the MJO is actually still, still poorly simulated. So a lot of the metrics that we use to diagnose the MJO are sort of standard but we looked more in particular in this paper at the vertical structure of the MJO. And what we see is that it's not actually getting deep enough into the troposphere, even though by some of our other measures, it looks quite good. So if we're basically still missing some important part of the MJO in our models, that could explain why we're missing this connection. It could be that there's also some other process that's not uh, as closely tied to temperature that is important. So something like cloud processes, I know Alejandro said that um, you all have a large cloud group at, at uh, UNAM, so it's possible that, that the QBO, which changes high clouds, that that somehow feeds back on the MJO in an important way. It's also very possible that there could be some more complex dynamical process, maybe having to do with, with wave propagation in the stratosphere, anything like that that, that could explain the MJO-QBO connection. And that's where I think if we had more work sort of putting forward mechanisms, we could test them more in the model. Um, another sort of possibility is that maybe GCMs are just not the right model for this question. So GCMs are coarse resolution, they have cumulus parameterizations, maybe we need to move to a different model type. And in fact, there has been some work using cloud resolving models and forecast models, which are higher resolution, that shows maybe some hint of an MJO-QBO connection. But it's still never really as strong in any model as, as we see in observations. And finally, um, I think it's worth confronting the possibility, and people have, have expressed this, that maybe the observed link is coincidental, perhaps. So as I said at the beginning, we only have you know, 40 years of data, and the QBO has a two-year period, so we don't have a ton of samples. But I think that that's unlikely, and I think it's for two reasons. So one is, if the MJO-QBO link were, a, were you know, chance, we might expect to see it once in a while in an ensemble run of a model but we never actually get an ensemble that looks like the observations nearly as strongly. That's true in our work and also in other work on the MJO-QBO link. And also, uh, this, the MJO-QBO link in observations has passed pretty much every statistical test that you can throw at it right now. So I think you know, if it is the case that we're missing something, then there's some sort of assumption about the degrees of freedom or the, the sort of interconnectedness of the atmosphere that we're not taking into account. So I think I would be very interested if someone could you know, describe more or publish something that showed how, how if this is due to chance, how would that work? You know, where did we go wrong? Um, so I'll just conclude with a few of my, my major points and then I'd be very eager to take your questions. So I hopefully have convinced you that these two oscillations, the Madden-Julian oscillation and the quasi-biennial oscillation are key modes of variability in the tropics. They're very important. Uh, and when the QBO winds are easterly, the MJO is stronger, and as we saw, also more predictable. But this MJO-QBO link that is so strong in observations is hard to model, 
and climate models fail to capture it. And so I think what this really means is we need to think more about what are our models possibly missing, right? Are they deficient in the stratosphere, in the troposphere? Is the coupling wrong? And also we discussed some, some avenues for future work, but I think that this, this research is really at a crossroads now where we need to, we need to sort of take a step back and re-examine maybe the approach uh, for modeling this connection. So the last slide, um, Alejandro had just asked that I, that I talk a little bit more broadly about, about sort of my group. Um, since I'm a postdoc, you know, I'm, I'm still, still building a group, but I did want to just give a sense of who some of the people behind this work are. And uh, I would be very happy to continue to talk to you or to put, you know, to try to build collaborations um, between these, these groups. So I personally have worked, as I said, on the MJO and the QBO and on stratosphere troposphere coupling. Um, I've also done a little work on radiative convective equilibrium, and for my postdoc, we're going to be looking at uh, predictability of the MJO using some new machine learning techniques. Uh, and on the right here, I just have some of my collaborators and mentors. So Adam, Shugong, and Clara are uh, three people who were very instrumental for this work. And then in my current work at CSU, I'm advised by Eric Maloney and Elizabeth Barnes. Uh, and finally, I have my email. You can follow me on Twitter, and I would encourage you to go on my website. So please feel free to reach out after the after the talk. I would be very happy to collaborate, to talk to you, to answer questions, and hopefully maybe connect some of these some of these groups on the call. So I think with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Alejandro and Christian for for questions. And thank you all again for joining uh, from wherever it is that you happen to be. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Zane. Thank sure. you for your presentation and thank you for your time in preparing this presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. We're very grateful for that. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Christian and I have the pleasure to conduct the question and answer section. So please raise your hand if you can, in the case you have a question and I can turn your microphone on. So please raise your hand. At this time, we don't have questions, so please don't be afraid. Okay, so Jorge Garcai have a question. I would turn the microphone on, so go ahead, please. Um, hi, Dr. Martin, Hello. can you can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah, how's it going? Um, so I had two quick questions. The first one was um, regarding the QBO definition. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of the uh, teleconnection work of the QBO has sort of shown that um, not just uh, defining the QBO based on one level, but of sort of a depth integrated yes. index would perhaps bring a better answer, at least to, to some of the other teleconnections of the QBO. I was wondering if you guys tried that. So we have have not, but there is um, a paper that if you email me, I can send you by Casey Densmore. Uh, D-E-N-S-M-O-R-E, -E. and in that paper they define the QBO using, I think you know this kind of, right, they, they use an EOF, a vertical EOF, so mm -hmm. instead of the QBO having, you know, an easterly and a westerly, it has a sort of phase like the MJO in the phase space. So in that paper they, they sort of distinguished between, you know, sort of mid-level QBOs, and I would say that their results, that that way of looking at it didn't it you know nothing sort of pops out right away when you redefine the QBO in in that way? So people have done that kind of work, but I think that um, it hasn't really shown too much of a difference to the sort of more more straightforward definitions that we've looked at. Um, but I think in terms of diagnosing the QBO in a model, maybe moving to that kind of EOF framework would be better. You know, we could look at that more to see to understand better how the model might be might be doing a good or bad job. That could be very interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I really liked your your discussion at the end on on, on how to sort of tackle the problem moving on. Yeah. Um, do you think that the answer may be just on, on the MJO hidden questions, uh, just on the, on the deep just understanding of on the of the MJO, or could it be also like just not knowing really how the QBO influences convection in general? Right. Uh, or both. Or, yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that the the hope originally was that this question would be easier than some of the other deep MJO questions, right? That this that understanding this link could maybe give us some some deep insight into the MJO relatively quickly, and that seems to not to not be the case. So I think you know, insofar as we have not been able to understand this link, in, you know, it's only been five years, but there's been a lot of work on this. 
that maybe you're right. You know, this is you can you can say this is sort of this is clearly an MJO mystery because the QBO doesn't really change deep convection. But I do think that you know we should think harder about stratosphere troposphere interactions more generally, and that maybe that work. You know, if if you study how does the QBO change mean convection, that work could lead to breakthroughs in this area. So I think that both you know both the MJO literature and the stratosphere troposphere literature need to need to sort of move forward and maybe that the answer will come from one of those two places but it's hard to know which which one that's a very good question it's a hard question thank you sure okay thank you the next questions will be made by brad please go ahead zane can you hear me yep Hey, great. Good afternoon. Really great presentation. Good to connect with you again. I, I really agree with you. I wish you had got a chance to go to go to Unam. I think you had a really a good visit there with the group. Um, a couple of maybe a points and then maybe a question about about this idea of, of seasonality of this relationship yeah. with QBO and MJO. First right. of all, really thanks for showing Phil Klotzbach's work. I hadn't seen that before. That was really interesting to see that mm. there may be longer term variability of the coupling and decoupling of the troposphere and the stratosphere with MJO and QBO that, that I didn't realize this is a, maybe a newer thing in the last maybe 40 or so years. So yes. that, that's that's really interesting. Um, you know, with, with regard to Casey's work, Casey's my student here at, at Naval Academy, so I'm very familiar with that. Um, the one of the things that we did find by coupling or not coupling by by going over a deeper integrated layer, we we found some some signal outside of boreal winter. So I wonder if you had any more thoughts on that with your modeling work. If you'd seen anything similar yeah. to you know you said very at the outset that that it's really a boreal winter uh, si signal, and right. we agree that the strongest signal is there. But we did find some other interesting things. So I wonder if you had found anything that you didn't show us today. Yeah, that's a great, okay, so so we did, when we did all this modeling work, um, we looked in every season because, as you say, we don't really understand why it should be in December, January, February, and so the thought was, you know, without knowing why the real world is in one season, we should look in all seasons in the model, and basically there is no, in all of these 11 ensemble members, there's only one season where you ever get um, a strong MJO QBO link, and it's only in one member. So we have 11 ensemble members and we looked at four seasons, right, in each one. In one member in the spring, uh, we saw a statistically significant uh, correlation between the MJO and the QBO in the model. Uh, and basically the way that we interpreted that, and we're thinking a little more about it, is that, you know, if you have enough seasons, maybe you could get a correlation by, by chance. And if you look at other measures of the MJO QBO link, it doesn't seem to be there in that one member in season. So. We've we've looked at it in models and uh, and you know for now we we haven't seen any any connection but I do think um, too many modeling studies just go immediately into looking at December January February and that probably doesn't make sense because as I said like we don't know why it should be in that season and observation so I think you're right to say that modelers need to look at at the full season um, uh, with regards to the issue of of trends on longer time scales so this Klotzbach thing that you mentioned. So I should say there is a paper that's that's uh, under review that hopefully will come out soon that that verifies this emergence in a different data set. But there's evidence that the QBO relationship has changed on longer time scales in other ways. So if you look at, for example, the connection between the QBO and tropical cyclones, there was a connection prior to the 1980s. And then since the 1980s, that connection has gone away. So there are these really interesting trends and in other QBO connections to the troposphere that that I think people have not really studied or or started to think about, you know, why why are they emerging recently? Well, that very interesting. Again, yeah. thanks for sharing that, and again, good good to hear you here yeah. in this virtual yeah. format. Thanks a lot. Thanks for popping in. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Brad. So the next question will be made by Fernanda Cerqueira. I suppose that she's from Brazil. So please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? I can, yep. Yeah, I'm from Brazil. I'm a professor in Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the, uh, thank you for a lecture, it's amazing. Uh, the, this, 
NJO can be all linked after the ages. Uh, maybe it can be a, a could be a interdecadal influence. Maybe PDO, some yeah. other interdecadal mode. Yep. Yeah. So that's a great. So so the point being made is basically like could this MJOQ be a signal either be be totally due to something else like the PDO, which is this low term variability in the in the ocean state, or maybe you know there's some sort of three way link. So it could be that the PDO impacts the MJO and the QBO is just along for the ride, or there could be some more you know complicated relationship. I think that that's that's possible in in theory, and maybe this emergence you know makes you makes you think about that. Um, this is one area where having good models would help. So that's one of the reasons why we did these these eleven members was to try to get a bunch of different right long term uh, oscillations, and we changed the sea surface temperature in the model. So at least oh, I looked at El Nino, but you could look at the PDO. We looked at does the is there any relationship in the models between basically the the modes of variability in the ocean and the MJOQBO link. And we found at least in the model that there wasn't really a connection between what the ocean was doing and you know, the MJOQBO link. So that, that maybe makes us think that it's not just ocean variability, but the, the model is wrong in a lot of ways. So, so yeah, I think that if, you know, if, if you're an expert on the PDO, you could look at this through that lens and, and maybe that would lead to some, some insights. I think that would be very, very interesting. Um, but it's hard to know, you know, right now it's hard to think about how the ocean, the stratosphere, and the MJO would be would be connected, right? That's a lot of parts of the, the climate system. Yeah, yeah it's it's difficult to, to link the all these modes. Sure. Thank no you. Has, yeah, no one has looked at this PDO angle. So I would say if you know if you work on that or if you're a specialist, that would be an interesting contribution to the literature to look at MJO, QBO, P, you know, one more acronym. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you. So anyone else has a question, please raise your hand. Okay, I see that Abby Becerra uh, wants to make a question, but she doesn't have an audio, she doesn't have a microphone, so I can't mm. turn your microphone on. Sorry for that. So anyone else? Can she type the question? Is there some chat? No, there is much chat. Sorry oh. for that. Yeah. You can so, email me. Or I can put my email up. So you can email me if you have more questions or connect. Yeah. So you could you could reach out there. Okay. So anyone else? No? Okay. I have a question. Sure. So thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering if you had checked like a momentum balance instead of just the winds and yeah. the models. Uh, so, do you mean check them to see if they're correct, or just look yeah. more generally? At we have not, so we haven't diagnosed them. And my guess is that, with the nudging, that they will be sort of, you know, we're imposing basically artificial momentum. You can think of it that way, right? When yeah. we force the QBO. So I, I think any kind of budget that you could do, it would be kind of kind of tricky to understand. Um, one point I guess I'll make is that I didn't talk about this, but the way that we do the nudging, we don't nudge at every grid point. We nudge only in the zonal mean. So maybe that allows for some more realistic, you know, local momentum transfer. But but um, we haven't looked at that. I think that would be another great way to look at this problem, even in observations. You know, people haven't really looked at in observations does the MJO change the momentum and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe, you know, maybe you can reach out to me and talk to me more about how we could go about calculating that in the model and and you know, we could think about again in this in this context with nudging, I don't know that it would make sense, but in other models you could look at biases and those kinds of things. Okay, thank you so much. So, yeah, Alejandro sure. has the last question, please. The hardest one. <laughs> the hardest one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess that Arturo wants to ask a question, but Oh, uh, he has a problem with his computer. Okay. Sorry, um, actually, I, I don't have a question. Uh, first, I want to to congratulate. To, you have a very good, a really nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I have more like a comment because it's very interesting. Like this kind of work points 
like in atmospheric science, we have focused on the troposphere, like the place where everything happens, and the right. other layers of the atmosphere is like, like the ether, the ether, like something mystical that really doesn't matter, but actually that's not the case. Like climate change show us that this the the stratosphere plays a very important role, and the QVO that you talk about also tell us that we are wrong if we think that the troposphere is everything there is. So I think that's, just, yes, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think there probably are some stratosphere people maybe here or elsewhere that would that would disagree but i i think that probably you know many people who study the tropics and in particular the mjo had not thought about the stratosphere at all and that's why this is such a a surprising relationship so i think that's a very good point and i also think that this connection has really reinvigorated the study of the stratosphere troposphere coupling so you know getting more people interested in that question is is one of my sort of goals in giving this talk is to make you feel like there is mystery going on. So I think I think that's a great point, Alejandro. Okay. And uh, Arturo sent me the question, his question. He oh, wants to know if there is models with QB, QBO that doesn't have an NGO. Um, yes, there are plenty of, yeah. There are models that have good QBOs that probably have bad MJOs. None, none come to mind, but I'm sure that those those types of models exist. So I guess maybe the question is thinking about, you know, can you get a QBO and no MJO? And I think that the answer is is yes. And even you can get, you know, very simple models of the QBO, very sort of idealized models that you could code up on a laptop, you know, those you can get by just giving the, you know, tropical tropical wave forcing associated with Kelvin waves or Rossby waves. So the sort of theory of the QBO and what drives it, um, doesn't have the role for the MJO per se in it right now. Um, so yes, I would I would guess that such models exist, and um, I would be curious to know like what Arturo would like to do with those models. And yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Okay. Um, anybody else wants to ask a question? Uh, Arturo has, has another question. question. Sorry. Pedro has a question. Yeah, hi. Hello. Hi, Zane. Uh, uh, great uh, talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, you have talked a bit about the effects of the MGO may, mainly related to convection on the tropics, but is there any signal of the MGO towards the climate over the mid-latitudes and higher latitudes? What's the effect over those areas? Yeah, that's a great, so so in general, right, I showed, for example, um, this slide that shows that the MJO impacts, right, the mid-latitudes, but I guess your question probably is more like, does this QBO MJO, you know, how does that link tie into this? So um, I'll show two figures. So this slide shows um, the, the teleconnection pattern associated with the MJO. So this is like the, um, the stream function in the upper part of the troposphere right after 10 days after the mjo is in a particular phase so if you study mjo teleconnections this will look familiar if you don't basically you see this this rossby wave train so the left panel is the mjo teleconnection when the qbo is easterly and the right panel is the same exact type of connection when the qbo is westerly and you see much stronger teleconnection patterns when the mjo right it, when the when the qbo is easterly the mjo has stronger teleconnections um, another way of saying that is, um, I'll just look at this plot quickly. So this plot shows the, the signal in precipitation over East Asia. So this is, right, like this is India here, China, you can see. Um, and the, the, on the left-hand side, you can see that easterly and westerly QBO precipitation signals, you see they're much weaker when the QBO is westerly. Right, so those are two different lines of evidence that show that there's there's changes in teleconnections. Um, the last point that I'll make is it's a little more complicated than this because the QBO changes teleconnections on its own and so does the MJO. And so there's sort of a lot of, it's, it's complicated to sort of disentangle in a given teleconnection 
is the MJO changing? Is the QBO changing? You know, what's what exactly is going on? So there, there are strong signals, MJO, QBO signals in the mid latitudes, um, but it's a little tricky to understand how they how they work. Uh, and if you're interested, you can you can email me. I can send you some more some more links on on that. That's a very good question, though. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Okay, we have more more one more question. That's great. Now, uh, Arturo, Mr. you have now your microphone on. Yeah, I I was able to to do that <laughs> for some reason that I don't understand. Yeah. Um, do you want me to ask something? If you have a question, go for it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was I was thinking about uh, Alan Plum's model. You yeah. know where where QBO is forced from wave activity from the surface. Yes. And and uh, and uh, and I was wondering if if you guys uh, kind of um, uh, um, computed wave activity in 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 the models and yeah. see if that is that is also um, observed. Uh, I mean, if it if it's close to observed. Uh, so we have we have not, and again, that's so. This is a great question, um, and and I think maybe what your question is getting at is, you know, could the could the MJO impact the QBO, right? Exactly. So my, yeah. my whole talk sort of implicitly assumes the QBO changes the MJO, but it's it's possible that the relationship goes the other way. Um, one thing that would be kind of confusing is, you know, the M, the MJO still seems to have this this sort of biennial change in strength. So if the MJO is having an upward impact, that doesn't really explain why the MJO itself is changing. But but that question aside, as far as I know, no one has looked at that those kinds of questions. So you know you could you could look at in observations, for example, what is the momentum flux due to the MJO itself, or due to the Kelvin and Rossby waves the MJO spins up. Um, one experiment that you could do that if if I had time, I could you know you could take that Plum model and try to put in some kind of realistic intraseasonal forcing and look at does the QBO change so that there's some neat questions you could ask um, I would say you know most of the literature has sort of assumed that the QBO has a downward impact and that makes more sense intuitively but no one has really explored the other direction and that's I think you know because we keep failing with these modeling studies where we're open to all the ideas you can give us so maybe that's that's a good way to, to go in the future and you know I would encourage you to do it, or or maybe someone else will be able to 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 do that calculation. Uh, those upward wave fluxes. That's a great question too. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed yeah. your your talk very much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Huh? Okay. <laughs> so our last question, finally. <laughs> so please, mentor. Uh, hello there. Hello, Doctor Hi. Martin. Oh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for the talk. Yeah, it was really interesting. In fact, this is the, the first time I'm here about this uh, relationship, Great. and it's re really, really interesting. I, I will say cool. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I, I have a, a concrete question. The first one is that maybe you can explain a little bit more of the effects of these, uh, the MGO, um, Q, QBO relation, uh, how affect the Atlantic basin? Um, mm. Then the another thing is that uh, I, I'm hearing so much things for, from you, from from everyone else about how maybe we are missing some physics in interaction in the middle and high levels. Um, maybe there's a new physics that, that has to be researched first. Um, and also, I I heard that you uh, talk about the machine learning. Yeah. models and all this stuff uh in the last two years there have been so much improvements uh you know that this this is that um, like the chatbots that are almost humans you know and can translate directly language to code and all this kind of stuff right now, do you think that maybe um this will be the the way to to go um, maybe these new machine learning models can predict or tell us something about these new physics that we need to research for you know get the link physically right cool okay yeah that's a lot of good questions so um so the first question on the atlantic basin um as far as i know uh there hasn't been any literature 
looking uh, particularly at the Atlantic and how the MJO QBO link might matter there. Um, you know, you could do something like, do the statistics of tropical cyclones change? Um, no one, as far as I know, has done that. There are two papers um, that look at sort of global MJO QBO teleconnections and how the how the right how the relationship modulates teleconnections globally. And I don't know off the top of my head, like I don't have in my head a a statement about the Atlantic, but I could you know I could look there or I could point you to that paper and, and maybe that that would be good. But but that's an area where you know if you study a particular feature in that basin, um, this would be the kind of thing that that you know you could look at more. To your question about missing physics, that's a very hard question. Obviously, we don't know what we don't know, right? So so it's hard to sort of know where to start. I, I think you know it's certainly possible that we're missing um, something at those upper levels. In particular, I've thought a lot about you know high thin cirrus clouds. We know that those are usually not very good in in a model. You know that the that the you need a high resolution vertical resolution to get those very thin clouds. And so I think it's very possible that that's an area where where the physics could be letting us down. Um, in terms of whether machine learning can answer this question, you know that's that's a great question, and I don't really have a good answer. I will say. Um, my impression of machine learning models that, for example, try to simulate convective parameterization. So if you use machine learning to try to replace, you know, the, the convective part of models, those actually tend to do not that well in the upper part of the of the troposphere. So usually when people show plots of those machine learning models, they look pretty good in much of the troposphere, but at upper levels, they, they don't do very well. I don't know if we understand why. Um, there's other machine learning methods um, that can try to disentangle sort of cause and effect. So, you know, you can try to figure out, does the MJO affect the QBO or the QBO affect the MJO? And those types of methods, I don't really remember what they're called. I think causal inference methods of machine learning, those could be very useful for this question in answering, you know, which direction does the relationship go? So I think that there's certainly ways in which machine learning can help us, but I think I think for me, this question is still one of, you know, we need better better theory and, and deeper thinking about what the physics could be. So I don't think that we're going to be able to throw a bunch of data at this and, and get the answer out. Um, yeah, that's a great question, though. It's a hard question. I wish I knew the answer. I think uh, my talk would be much better if I could answer it. <laughs> yeah, th thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question. So that's all from me, and I finished the question and answer section. Thank you so much, Saint, yeah, for your thank patience you guys. and your time and explaining all, all this hard topic. It's, it's really interesting and, Great. and innovative, you know? So thank you so much. It was a pleasure to yeah, hear. Yeah, it was uh, delightful to talk. Uh, thank you. It's a turn to speak, uh, Alejandro. Yeah, Saint, uh, thank you again. Uh, sure. I'm very glad that you, you made it today to join us and um, I'm looking forward to having you here in Mexico visiting us. <laughs> yeah. It's just a shame that we had to do this by 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 internet, but but it's it right now. Yeah. yeah. So we're really looking forward to having you here and Eric. I think Eric is connected here in this. Oh, so hi, Eric. we would like to have Eric here too in the very near future when this pandemic ends, hopefully very soon. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, we are very glad that we got people connected from everywhere in the world. And it's very nice to, to have this community growing very fast and pe of people uh, interested in, in the atmospheric science, mainly in Hispanic America. Uh, uh, people interested in, in knowing about future seminars, I'm sending uh, a link to our Google form. If you want to receive more information for future seminars, you can click on that link and subscribe so you will receive future seminar invitations. Um, uh, right now, the university is going for summer vacations. So we are going to continue with the seminars till the end of July. So be ready because a lot of very nice talks are coming in the future seminars and you 
you are very welcome to come in and join us. And again, for third time and fourth time, saying thank you very much. Really, really nice talk. It's, thank you. It's, I think that people got the idea about the NGO and the QBO. So thank you again and and enjoy your time in pandemic pandemic time. <laughs> I hope you you have a great time. Thank you. Despite Thanks. this this situation. Uh, so we are going to close the, the the session and thank you everybody for for being here.